way in um, on my uh, train journey in this morning, I was doing my social media feeds, and this um, quote popped up. Um, People often mistakenly think trans, with the asterisks, is a modern first world phenomenon. No, being trans isn't a new phenomenon, nor are trans experiences limited to first world countries. We have always been here, and we have always existed everywhere, and will continue to exist everywhere. The internet gave us a voice, and this is our time, this is our civil rights movement, and we will prevail. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not that. It was, it was just a nice little piece of um, material that came in this morning on the route, and it's not really fresh material. So, um, hi, I'm Alex Drummond. I go by the identity girl Alex. You can Google me. You'll find I'm the author of a book on transgender. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I've, I've read a book about being transgender. I have a presence on YouTube. You'll find um, bits of videography I've been involved in. Oh, yeah. Um, you'll find various pieces. I keep spotting people I'm spotted today. So, um, um, you can go to my website, girlalex.co.uk, and um, see some, some of my work. On, uh, on the girlalex.co.uk website, there's a tab that says Being Transgender, and um, there's some stuff on there, including a video I did of um, a presentation I gave at the Warwick Conference last year, where I talked more about the kind of transgender theory and some clinical implications. So if, you're into, you know, if you enjoy my material today, just look me up on the website, go to the Being Transgender page, and you'll find the, the, the Warwick video. If you go to transseminars.com, there's a whole load of other stuff that we've done at the Warwick that's really, really interesting. Um, speak to me later if you want the, the links to that one. So, I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm a photographer. I identify as a trans woman, and I prefer the use of female pronouns. Now, my approach to transition, or rather my approach to undergoing a process, or part of a process, <laughs> catch the language there, um, of transition then, uh, uh, to live as a trans woman is what I'd like to bring you today. Now, if I go that bit, there. So that brings me then on to this idea of autoethnography. Here, um, I am both subject and observer within my own research process and within my own lived experience. So um, it's about um, living out an experience, reflecting on it, and, and being aware of the impact and the to and fro between um, myself and my environment. Before I actually came out, I only had assumptions and perceptions of what life post-transition would be, assumptions and perceptions of what was required of me as a trans woman. What my research has shown is that the possibilities were greater than I imagined possible and that the sacrifices could be less. So, certainly for far too many years I struggled with internalised shame, which is some points that have been raised today, and I lived in constant fear of discovery of being found out. And the notion of going outdoors and presenting as female was beyond ridiculous. Uh, I, I felt sure I'd, I'd, no, I'd make no more than ten paces before being beaten up, assaulted or spat at or something. And of the stories I'd read up to then, and now think about how media reporting has significantly shifted in the last couple of years, the perception was that transsexuals were pitiful freaks who'd end up divorced and jobless and subject to ridicule if they set foot outdoors. No wonder I lived in the closet for so long. So what changed? When I did my masters, I started to find new answers to questions that had always plagued me. How was it possible that I just always felt like I should have been raised a girl? I should always have belonged to the girl group. When 1980s feminism had taught me that gender was purely a social construct and any notion of being a woman trapped in a man's body was clearly a delusion of gender. Well, I didn't see myself as delusional or indeed perverted, which was the other option if you look at the medical definitions back then. So, if I could validate and honour my true self as female, how could I live that experience in the real world? Could I pass, or more importantly, could I gain acceptance? I'm going to come on to the notion of passing later um, in this presentation, and why I see passing as at times problematic. But if I, for now, just draw on the words of Stephen Whittle, writing in 2007, I want to illustrate a point here. So this is Stephen Whittle writing. Thus, whilst the trans man will experience some social problems in the first year or so of transition, these often fade away as they quickly come to look physically very masculine, at least while clothed. On the other hand, many trans women will face difficulties for many years of their life 
as they struggle with the limitations of medicine and surgery to facilitate their passing as an ordinary woman in their day-to-day -day life. Consequently, they are more likely to become victims of transphobia and they are more likely to experience the social stigmatization that goes with that. So that was um, Stephen Whittle talking in 2007. Well, one thing was for sure, having endured many years of being bullied as a child for being a poor, for queer, a sissy, a gay, an effeminate, I sure as hell wasn't going to put myself back into that position again. And yet equally, if I'd spent much of my life trying to pass as male by presenting a false self, I didn't want to feel pressured into the, the sort of notion of, of striving to be a, a, a convincing woman, whatever that was. What I wanted most was to live an authentic self and to find acceptance for that. So it is more by accident than design, more by serendipity than explicit plan, that I find myself here today. Living successfully post-transition as a trans woman and illustrating what gender queer might offer us all as clinicians and researchers as we seek to find those insights and strategies that could ease the distress of our clients. I'm going to start with this quote from the New Statesman. Some people see gender as a galaxy of possibilities. I experience it as a trap, a network of prejudices rooted in conservative notions of complementary and evolutionary purpose. The author continues, I don't believe my gender identity is female. I inhabit a female body as opposed to a male or intersex one, and it does many of the things that a female body is expected to do. Myself, my identity is something else. I possess some attributes considered typically female and some considered typically male. This does not make me special or unusual. I construct a reality in relation to my body and the gender-based prejudices that come with having this body as best I can. Isn't that all any of us can do? And I like that. Back in 2010, after years of contemplating transsexual surgery and seeing only negative stories reported and thus recoiling from the thought with a mixture of fear and self-disgust, I started to become aware of the idea of transgender as a broader identity than transsexual. Up to then, I'd never heard the term. So reflect here on the idea that the knowledge of our clients is constrained then and defined by the knowledge that they've been exposed to. You can only know what you know. For me, back in 2010, contemplating my transition, I was concerned about what happened if I went ahead. I was concerned that as permission, my clients would run from the room screaming that I'd lose my business, my home, my relationship, my nice car. That I'd lose everything that I'd worked so hard for. So think about this for a moment. Where were these ideas coming from? How had I come to develop and internalize those perceptions? As I alluded to earlier, media reporting of trans narratives has for a long time been negative and sensationalizing. And the journey of the transsexual had always been reported as a medicalized one, one of psychiatric diagnoses, <coughs> of hormones, of surgery. Little mention is ever made of the psychosocial process transition. As a clinician now, I often meet trans women in particular who imagine that the journey of transition might be resolved, simply be resolved, by hormones and surgery, preferably administered as quickly as possible, and with the perception that post-surgery they will be read and accepted only as female, that their transsexual past or male history might be entirely eradicated and a trouble-free life awaits. As Whittle suggested earlier, and certainly the case for many who transition, particularly later in life, the reality may be less easily achieved. Some of the reasons for that I'm going to come on to later. So importantly for me at the time, I was unaware of exemplars, unaware of positive role models who could illustrate a more successful outcome. Who else had transitioned on the job as a counsellor? In fact, who actually worked as a post-transition therapist? Knowing counselling to be a conservative profession, I worried that the employer system programmes that provided a significant mainstay of my work would suddenly withdraw referrals. I hear a chuckle, there's more on that story later. As it happens, I managed my transition carefully and the result has been I still have my business, my home, my partner, my nice car. <laughs> 
The AB work is drying up, but that's due to the economic climate. But two or three still send me clients, even though my rates are higher than other clinicians and higher than their standard, than their standard rates. Um, importantly, then, as I illustrate later, my outcome stats are still strong, and in my private work, the majority of my referrals are by personal recommendation. So if you're wondering, how does that work? It just does. I'll start with this um, quote from Jenny Finney Boylan. They asked me what it was like to cross-dress back before my transition. My answer, it was like Beatles heaven. You know that moment in Day in the Life when Paul sings, somebody spoke, and I went into a dream, and John sings the word, ah, for 12 bars. That's what it was like. Cross-dressing is a curious notion. Clothing is an important identifier of many aspects of self, social status, identity, authority, allegiance. And within our culture for a long time, gender has been coded by certain items of clothing. I use the term allegiance there. The idea that clothing indicates belonging <coughs> and identification. For someone raised as male, certain items of clothing remain taboo. The items that are exclusively and therefore quintessentially female, and so in their own way, they become idolized, or if you want, fetishized, because they are forbidden but desired. As a child growing up, I dreamed of seeing myself like the other girls, going to the party in my snow white dress, being the bridesmaid of Valerina. Who wouldn't? There's a curious yearning, a longing to identify with your peer group, to look like your peers. As an adult, there is a curiosity to recapture that experience, and yet it's also caught up in shame. In seeking to interpret our clients' narratives about their experiences, their explanations, and their self-definitions of so-called cross-dressing, we need to think about the frames of reference that they come from, and to be open to broader interpretation of the data. An important consideration when seeing a client who presents as transvestite, for example, is in considering the symbolism of the fetishized clothing. Is it about the power play, the clothing texture, or the taboo that generates the tension? Because if it's the latter, the data shows that post-transition, people who are formally defined as transvestite and eroticize the act of cross-dressing subsequently lose any sexual association and just wear the clothes guilt-free having embraced a transgender or transsexual identity. The um, caption there, look cute at normal, um, comes from Freya Benson. I don't know how many uh, you know Freya. I just love it. It's, um, it's brilliant. Um, so, Lucille Sorella is an American who runs a support website um, for trans women. She says... I'm a huge advocate for transgender rights, but I have to admit there's one thing that upsets me. Many of the cross-dressers and transgender women I see in public look ridiculous. They make the entire transgender community look bad. I know these girls try hard to look good, but the simple fact is they're making fools of themselves. Some of the mistakes I see cross-dressers and transgender women make are dressing like hookers, acting nervous and awkward in public, wearing tacky makeup, talking like a gay guy, <laughs> walking, walking like they've just got off a horse, wearing clothes that are ten years out of date. She concludes, sorry, she's American, we'll forget that. Um, she concludes with, it's not their fault, they didn't get the proper education on how to present themselves as women. But is it any wonder so many people stare and laugh when they see a cross-dressed or a trans woman in public? Okay, that's Lucille Sorella. Let me uh, stay with this theme for a moment. Vicky Bond in the Huffington Post describes an incident on the, on the way home on the subway. I guess because he perceived me as trans, a young man called me a freak and then threatened me with physical violence. Well, I'm a cisgender woman, but I understand how that night I might not have looked the part. For the fashion show earlier, my hair had been teased into a huge fluffy afro. I wore yellow and blue eyeshadow, pure and bright as paint dabs on a mixing palette. Okay. And finally, Paris Lees writing in the Vice magazine. Peter Capaldi played a transsexual in Prime Suspect. He looked crap. He looked pathetic. 
He looked miserable. His character had shit hair, shit makeup, and a sheepishness that invites derision. She's a bedwetter in a bad wig, essentially. A transgender stereotype that, at the time, wasn't without foundation. Ouch, girlfriend. Um, so it's all pretty damning stuff. And it seems like trans women have a reputation for looking bad. Now, it may be, it may be it's reasonable, especially for later life transition, transitioners, to make a few fashion faux pas. Especially since, as Lucille Serrano observes, they've missed out on that teenage bitch fest of, of teenage girlhood to, uh, to learn what suits their, their, their shape. And maybe it's understandable too that some have a longing to make up for lost time to wear clothes that recapture or relive an experience of something lost. And they have been guilty of that. But if we're thinking from a clinical perspective, okay, if we're thinking from a clinical perspective about helping a client who worries about passing and about how others will react, react to them, and in even more general terms, looking at how to facilitate successful transition, is there a place for feedback and coaching, psychoeducational strategies on the importance of fashion and style? I just push that thought out there to consider. In fact, let's, let's for a moment consider the impact of physical attractiveness on human social interaction. In a research paper on this subject, Langlois et al. write the following. Common, ma common maxims about beauty suggest that attractiveness is not important in life. In contrast, both fitness-related evolutionary theory and socialization theory suggest that attractiveness does influence development and interaction. In 11 meta-analyses, the authors evaluate these contradictory claims, demonstrating that raters agree about who is and who is not attractive both within and across cultures. Attractive children and adults are judged more positively than unattractive children and adults, even by those who know them, and that attractive children and adults are treated more positively than unattractive children and adults, even by those who know them, and that attractive children and adults exhibit more positive behaviours and traits than unattractive children and adults. In short, unattractive people are treated differently to attractive people. Looks matter. The effects of facial um, attractiveness, are the, and they, they go on to say, the effects of facial attractiveness are robust and pandemic, extending beyond initial impressions of strangers to actual interactions with those who these people know and observe. Contrary to conventional wisdom, there is strong agreement both within and across cultures about who is and who is not attractive. Furthermore, attractiveness is a significant advantage for both children and adults in almost every domain of judgment, treatment, and behavior that we examine. Okay? So they say attractiveness leverages your social capital, it buys you, buys you the long run. Now that may sit uncomfortably with us, but the truth isn't always politically correct. We live, somebody said uh, earlier on, isn't it, you know, the problem with society? Yep. But we live within society. So if we're going to, if we're to live within that society, we have to accommodate the just. So, given the impact of testosterone on facial features and the fact that trans women are often read as male history because of facial traits, we might wonder whether more emphasis needs to be put on offering facial feminization surgery as part of the care pathway. Now, there's two schools on that, because there are some of us who say there ought to be nothing wrong with being visibly trans, but there are other people who actually have to live within a society that is hostile. I, I'm not passing judgment on them, I'm just putting it out there. But, um, so, so when it comes to me then, I may look different or a bit offbeat, but what I've found is that post-transition, people relate more positively to me. More positively than when I was trying to pass as male. I have more friends and I get more compliments. And I don't want to sound conceited or arrogant, it just is the way it is. I'm just reporting the data. There's a quote from Shirley Wang in the Wall Street Journal that um, is entire, from an article entitled Success Outside the Dress Code that may explain. There are boundaries to the benefits of looking different, the Harvard study showed. If an individual was viewed as accidentally out of sync with everyone else, such as mistaking wearing a red bow tie rather than black at the formal dinner, that erased positive feelings about their survey. But those imp opinions improved when the survey group believed that the contrarian acted deliberately on purpose. And maybe that's something of, um, if, some, you know, if somebody in the street looks at me and goes, what the fuck? <laughs> it is, 
they're not curious about the idea of, um, uh, you know, is that someone pretending to be what it's like? Obviously, there's somebody transgender there. They can see male history and female presentation. So it takes away the confusion. So, gender queer, the challenges. Um, I'm doing for time. Ten minutes. I'm spot on. I'm so good. Right. Um, <laughs> I don't normally work from the script, I, free, I freestyle and that just goes all over the place, right, okay. Um, Sarah Savage, some of you may know Sarah, the lovely Sarah Savage um, from My Transsexual Summer. Um, she writes on her blog, I truly believe that the whole of society is on the cusp of a gender identity revolution that will be on the scale of a sexual revolution in the 60s and 70s. More and more young people are freeing themselves from the binary handcuffs of the traditional ideas of what it means to be a man and a woman. One of the reasons which held me back from attempting to transition for so long was that I just didn't feel like I fitted into what was expected of me to be a transsexual. Up until a few years ago, I just thought that the word queer was another gay insult. And as I've learned more about the complexities of gender theory, my own identity has evolved. She goes on to say, I'm not knocking the people who identify as totally male or female. It's their right to be true to themselves. And I understand the merit of medically based definitions but I can see, in ten years or so, words like transsexual and transgender being viewed as old-fashioned and exclusionary. While the conversation about gender-varied people evolving, and, whilst, um, and while it is yet another label, it is one whose meaning is wider and helps society to understand that the fight for acceptance and equality isn't one of a tiny minority, but something that is relevant and means something to millions of people. So genderqueer and other non-binary expressions of gender are gradually <coughs> are appearing, particularly a um, growing movement in the US. Uh, anybody read uh, Beelin and Rankin 2012, uh, The Lives of Transgender People? Brilliant, brilliant book. Um, because it's really right at the cutting edge of what's happening in, in colleges and universities in America. Um, they just thought they'd got their heads around accommodating trans men and trans women and allowing them into the toilet. And now they've got a whole load of genderqueer people and non-binaries and they're having to actually make <laughs> dedicated toilets. Now, I was at the University of Glamorgan the other day visiting on a bit of business and they've also just introduced a non-gendered toilet for their genderqueer and non-binary students. Yay, Glamorgan. Except they're actually called the University of South Wales because they took over the other one, but that's not a story. Right, where was I? Um, so... The, um, there's this growing movement then in the US. There is still a perception that the there is still a perception among the community that the clinics are hostile to gender expression outside the stereotypical and binary. And many in the community, the trans community, especially the internet community, still promote those myths. And this may explain the quote from a friend of mine, the psychiatrist Stuart Lorimer, who was at a world conference on trans healthcare and medicine, who posted on Facebook. Genderqueer is reported as if it's an impossibly exotic subspecies rarely glimpsed. Well, I guess it would be within the clinics if everyone's told you can't go and like, just tell them you're ambivalent. Um, so perhaps the biggest and dumbest stumbling block is that people haven't been given a language beyond the binary. The hospitality industry, for example, must address you courtesy, courteously as sir or madam. And for hotel or catering staff, it's confusing and it can lead to hurt feelings for trans people. Humans don't like feeling conned, duped, or made to feel stupid. And I believe that some of the issues around misgendering can be explained quite simply by the idea that people don't know it's okay to use gender matched to presentation rather than the perception of biology. As we see greater awareness of transgender in popular media and increasingly now within schools, does anyone catch my piece in the Daily Mirror on Saturday? Ah, uh, yay me. Slowly people, because you know, it's good putting more positive stories out there. Slowly people will come to accept that we can unhook the pronouns from anatomy and apply them to personality. But we still have some way to go. The Equality Act is a really important and broadly helpful piece of legislation that significantly shifted the goalposts. It took away the need or requirement for medical intervention. That's the, that's the, the key killer bit. Okay? Now, the problem is, it's civil law, not criminal law. When someone discriminates against you, you can't call the equality police and have them busted. No, you have to sue them for loss. And that's hideously expensive and horribly stressful. Now, um, in my case, I did have to take a, trans a tribunal against a particular employer system program. And uh, what I was able to prove 
was that I was undergoing a process or part of a process for the purpose of reassigning my sex to identify as a trans woman by changing physiological or other attributes of sex, albeit without medical or hormonal intervention, and that was okay. The toilet question, everyone loves the toilet question. <laughs> it's a dilemma. Go in one and get beat up, go in the other one and get yelled at. Wouldn't it be lovely if we just had individual cubicles and non-gendered toilets? Wouldn't that solve like the great dilemma of gender? Um, Sarah Brown, um, as a city councillor, and um, basically it, 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 it says it all, doesn't it? You know, she's a trans woman, she looks like a woman, what the fuck? Yeah? Why is it she still gets called sir? How does that work? Yeah? And, they, and so there's something of, what is it that people are reading? And that comes back to the bit about unhooking language. If we could get into schools, we could educate them and more than a broader, community, broader society, if we could help people unhook the language and just go with presentation, not apparent biology, wouldn't that be great? <clears throat> Um, do, 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 have I finished? I think, oh yeah, that's another one. Um, one of the issues about um, passing is there are so many clues. So here is someone with long hair, skirt, boots, tights, jewellery, but the posture's male. That's me, by the way. <laughs> really? just, 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 just in case, you know. I'm, 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 not, I'm not picking on someone, I'm picking on me. Look, but, it's so, but there are so many things. There are so many things that give the game away um, in the sense of you're not necessarily natally female or um, it, you know, it, you're, you know, your male history defects me. So learning posture and gait and demeanor and a whole load of other stuff otherwise gives the game away. Um, there's a whole load of stuff about trans politics. There are all sorts of infighting within trans politics. That kind of says pretty much all you need to know about trans politics. Um, <laughs> life is invariably more of a struggle for some people than others. Um, I took that picture, and I like that quote. Thank you, people. <laughs>